Is it nice and clear for you? That's good because I'm in a different office today so I just need to make sure it's all working fine. Thank you so much for making time to come and listen to this um, webinar. Um, lots of people from Eastern Europe, lots of people from South America. Um, so it's great. Thank you for making the time. I know, as Emily said, it is quite late um, for some people in Europe, certainly. So I hope you don't fall asleep. I hope I can keep you awake. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about 21st century skills. And we're particularly going to talk about um, 21st century skills uh, in relation to young learners. So this is um, children of primary school age. And what I'm hoping to do is just give you some ideas of ways that you can help your students develop 21st century skills. OK. So what do you think of when you hear the words 21st century skills? I think sometimes people think of this kind of thing. They think of technology. Um, these are some kids using virtual reality glasses. Um, so yeah, you think of modern technology. You think of uh, the internet, the web, um, social media, things like that. <clears throat> but actually, um, quite often when we talk about 21st century skills, we're talking about something more like, almost like soft skills. And we're going to go into that in a minute. But first of all, what I'd like you to do is to think about how you think students need to be in the 21st century world. So what kind of skills do they need? What kind of abilities do they need? In the 21st century world, we need to be what kind of things? So you're talking about collaboration, adaptable, yep strategic, teamwork, so there's lots of idea about collaboration, teamwork, communication. You obviously know about the four C's there. Sociable, yeah, cooperation. Any more ideas? Aware of the environment, that's really important. Yep, I would agree with all of those. Confident is really important, yeah. So I've put together some things that I thought uh, the important things that we need to be teaching our, our students for the 21st century. So first of all, they need to be conventionally and digitally literate. So we talk about conventionally literate in that they can read and write, as uh, they can read books, they can read magazines, um, they can read newspapers. But I think it's also really important that they're digitally literate, which means they can kind of understand social media and texts and things like that. And they understand how that works, and they can make sense of it. So that's really important. The next thing I thought of was independent, and I think some people mentioned that already. You've mentioned autonomous in the chat box, independent. So I think it's very important for students to be able to work independently. Um, and increasingly, they're going to be able to do that, because um, increasingly, people are able to access so much stuff from home. But that also means that they can work on stuff by themselves. So independence and autonomy is really important. But equally, although it's really important to be able to be independent, students also need to be team workers. And that, again, I saw you notice you mentioning up there in the chat box, you've talked about collaboration. Team working is really, really important. Um, and um, if we're able to communicate with people all around the world, just as we are today, we're all working as a team right now because we're communicating with each other and uh, hopefully sharing some ideas. So team working is really important. Um, problem solvers. So when we see that increasingly um, computers and technology can take over some of the more sort of manual work, then I think it's really important that our students are increasingly encouraged to be um, problem solvers. Uh, and that's the kind of ability and skill that a computer can't really do. So problem solvers. And creative, again, that's something else that computers can't do for us. So it's really important that we encourage those skills in our students. So if we want to <clears throat> have students that are all those things in the 21st century world, then what kind of classroom do we need to create? Well, first of all, let me just show you a quote the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So I think that's a really interesting quote. That's from Alwyn Toffler, who's a writer and businessman. And he, he wrote a lot about how he saw the future. 
and it really is about being able to learn new things and also unlearn new things and um, be very flexible and I think that's really important. So let's think about that 21st century classroom because I think the classroom has changed so much in the last 20 years and what I'm going to ask you to do, it's a very very easy task so it's not too challenging for you, is to look at these two sentences. Students work collaboratively and students work in isolation and which one do you think fits into the 20th century classroom which one do you think fits into the 21st century classroom? So isolation is for the 20th or the 21st? So, yep, so that's right. So isolation, students work in isolation goes into the 20th century classroom. In the 21st century classroom, we would hope that our students will work collaboratively. Okay, let's have a look at another couple of sentences. The teacher is the sage on the stage. If you know what the word sage means, it means the person who knows everything. The person who knows everything, who stands on the stage and imparts information to the students. Or the teacher is the guide on the side. So actually you let your students do some of the research, you let your students find things out, but you're there to help them. So that's right, you've got it. So the, the sage on the stage is the 20th century and the guide on the side is the 21st century. Students are active learners, students are passive learners. So do your students sit and just take in all the information that you give them or do they have to work to try and work things out for themselves? Absolutely right, yeah. So we've got the passive learners from the 20th century classroom but hopefully in the 21st century classroom we want our students to be active learners. Students focus on learning facts or on discovering facts. Which one do you think? Yeah. So when we were just learning facts, that was more of a 20th century attitude towards um, education. But in the 21st century, we're trying to get students to discover facts for themselves. And of course, if you discover facts for yourself, you're far more likely to remember them and to be engaged. And finally, once you've learnt and discovered those facts, is the emphasis on analysing and using them to create something new or remembering and applying them? So which one do you think fits into 20th century? Yeah, exactly. So the remembering and applying, which is still important, it's not that that's not important, but I think more of an emphasis in the 21st century is on analysing facts and using them to create something new. All right, so that's our picture of a, a 21st century classroom. And for that 21st century classroom, we need 21st century skills. <clears throat> so I think some of you have already said up in the chat box that you know about the, the four C's, as we call them. Uh, these are what we call the four C's. So it's critical thinking. Let me just get my little... We are. Critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and creativity. So, um, how did these four C's come about? Who thought of them? Well, what happened was there was a, a partnership put together called the Partnership for 21st Century Learning. Um, and this is a non-profit organization that uh, started in the USA and it involved the National Education Association, the Department of Education in the USA, and then other big organizations like AOL Time Warner, Apple Computers, Microsoft, Dell. So they all kind of got together in the early 2000s and they said, what do we need to do to make sure that our students are really being prepared for the 21st century um, for the 21st century, for the future, and they worked out that these were the four critical skills. So back in the sort of 19th and 20th century, we would talk about the three R's, which were reading, writing, and arithmetic. And in the 21st century, we talk about the four C's, and that's what they are, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and creativity. And one thing that's really important to remember is that 
they don't exist independently of each other. So it's almost impossible to collaborate without communicating, for example. Um, very often when you're creative, you're also thinking in a critical way. So the skills all kind of work together and that's ideally what you want to try and get in your classroom. And of course, when you're teaching English, you're in a fantastic position to do that because you can't possibly teach English without communicating. And of course, when you teach English, your students are going to be collaborating because that's what they do. They talk to one another, they help one another. So, you know, I think of all the subjects that are being taught on the curriculum and all the subjects that are being taught in school, when you're teaching a language, you're really getting right in there and teaching those four C's. So that's good news for us as language teachers. So let's have a look now at each one of these four C's. You just bear with me, I'm gonna, I've got my heater on and I'm getting too hot, so I'm just gonna switch it off. That's better, right. So let's have a look at each one of these four C's. And what I'm gonna try and do is I'm gonna give you some ideas of how you can um, use activities to develop these in the classroom. And the, uh, the ideas that I'm gonna give you are from Look, which Emily's gonna tell you about later, but you can, you can find similar activities in other books. So let's have a look. Let's start with critical thinking. So critical thinking means the ability to analyze and interpret information, the ability to evaluate ideas, to make decisions, and to solve problems. Now, all that sounds, can sound quite adult, can't it? Or quite kind of, you know, upper age of teenagers and you might think well um, that's great but how can I expect my seven-year-old primary school students to be critical thinkers but actually I think that young kids are tremendous critical thinkers because if I were to um, try and paraphrase in one sentence what critical thinking is about I would say critical thinking is about asking the question why and you'll know if you work with young learners they ask the question why all the time. They always want to know why. Well, that's a critical thinker. It's just someone who doesn't immediately take the face value of something, but always wants to know the reason behind it. And there are great ways that we can get our kids critically thinking in the classroom. Now, my favorite thing to use is always pictures. I love using pictures. They get a great reaction. Um, you can do so much with them. And so, Here's a way that we can get our students critically thinking. So let's have a look at a picture. Right. So now I'm going to get you to start your critical thinking. So I want you to look at the picture and use some of the clues from that picture to try and guess where do you think these people are? Do you want to try and guess what country they're from? Mongolia, Tibet, yeah. Any other ideas? Korea, Mexico, Nepal, Kazakhstan. You haven't got it yet, but <laughs> you're in the right area. Kyrgyzstan is probably closest. Kazakhstan. It's a stan. Okay. It's not Mexico. No, you're right. It's not Mexico. So, let's see. So, there we are. These are shepherds in Afghanistan. Yes, Kata got it right. They're shepherds in Afghanistan. And as you can see, they're looking at their cell phones, but they can only use their cell phones to play music and take photos. They can't use their cell phones to, um, to make phone calls. Now, why do you think that would be? Why do you think that they can use their phones to take photos and to listen to music, but they can't use their phones to actually make calls to people? You've got it right, exactly. There's no signal, there's no internet. So I've just got you really thinking critically. You've looked at a picture and you've made some uh, decisions about that picture and you've made some guesses about it and you've got it absolutely right. So that's just one way that we can get our young students thinking really critically right at the beginning of the lesson. Um, so these, you can see the questions here. Where are these people? You've got that right, what are they doing? Why do you think they can't use their phones to make phone calls? And then finally, you get your students to think about how they relate that back to themselves. How do you communicate with people like your school friends and your family and people who live far away? So there's one example. 
Let's have a look at another one. Oops, it's gone too. There we go. Right, so this is uh, really quite a basic um, example. This is just a, a classic vocabulary learning exercise that I'm sure you're very familiar with, um, where you look at the pictures and you can see the different domestic chores. So there's cook lunch, do the washing up, feed the dog. So the students would uh, look at the pictures and they'd point to the words while they're listening and repeat them and act them out, which is just your normal way of learning vocabulary. But then look at, let's look at that last activity, that fourth activity, which is order. And that's a classic critical thinking activity because now you're asking them, put them in the order of the ones that you like doing or the ones that you don't like doing most of all or the ones that are most important in your house or the ones that you think are least important. And that way you're getting your students to think much more about not just what the words mean, but um, they're applying their critical thinking to them. So it's a really simple activity that you can use with young students, but you're getting them to use their critical thinking skills. OK, let's have a look at another activity. So this one is for slightly, this one is for slightly um, older kids. Um, and this is a, a reading passage. So we have um, some extra long reading passages in, um, in Look. And I just thought it would be nice to have a look at one of them. Um, I really love using stories as well. And um, I think particularly using traditional stories from all sorts of different cultures is really interesting for children. And I often find it fascinating to see how many traditional stories um, are actually the same across cultures or have very similar ideas. So the text is very small on this. And I don't know how many people know the story of the wind and the sun. But I thought I'd just read it to you. So here it is in the book. I'm just going to read it to you. I might have to take my glasses off. Yes, I have to take my glasses off for this. Right, here we go. One day, the wind said to the sun, there are not many things in this world stronger than us, are there? You're right, said the sun, but we are strong in different ways. Different ways, asked the wind. You're saying that because you're weaker than me. Really? Do you think so? asked the sun. Then let's have a competition to see how strong we are. Good idea, agreed the wind. Far below them there was a road, and on the road they could see a man walking. He wore a winter coat and a scarf. I know, said the sun. Let's see which one of us can take the coat and scarf off that man. Ha, said the wind. That's easy for me. I can blow them off him. So the wind blew and blew. The leaves flew from the trees. The animals on the ground were scared. Even the birds were scared. The man was very cold. Oh, he said, what a horrible day. He held his coat. He held his scarf. And he didn't take them off. The wind blew more. But the man held his coat more. In the end, the wind was so tired he had to stop. Then the sun came out from behind a cloud. The sun was hot. Oh, said the man, what a beautiful day it is now. He took off his scarf. The sun grew hotter and hotter. The man was so hot, he took off his coat and sat down under a tree. How did you do that? asked the wind. Ah, said the sun, I told you there are different ways to be strong. You can blow the leaves from the trees and you can make the animals scared. But sometimes when you want people to do things for you, it's better not to force them. So there's a really nice traditional tale and it's got a lovely little um, it's got a lovely little moral to it. So the kids can enjoy hearing the story. I'm glad you enjoyed it too. <laughs> um, and then you know you'd get them to answer the question so they look at the picture and look at the weather and they read the story and listen to it and answer the questions about it. But if you have a look at I'm just trying to get my pointer back. I'm very bad at getting this pointer to work. Here we are. If you have a look at exercise four, this is where the critical thinking comes in. So work in pairs. How can you do these things? Is it best to use strength or a different way? Open a coconut, take a piano upstairs, move a donkey that doesn't want to move, or get all the juice from a lemon. 
So that's, again, you're getting your students to use their critical thinking skills. So they've enjoyed the story, they've done the reading comprehension or the listening comprehension, but now they're really applying what they've learned to something new, and that's a classic critical thinking activity. All right, so let me just give you some ideas of different ways that you can use critical thinking skills in the classroom. Here are some examples. Look at a picture and make guesses. So we did that with the guys with their cell phones. Rank things. So we looked at that as well. You can rank them by size or by preference or by speed or by cost. Lots of different ways you can get students to rank things. You can use puzzles and games. So when you get them to think critically about something like odd one out or spot the difference. You can match things like if they match the names of sports and sports equipment. Identify opinions. That will probably be for slightly older students where they read a passage and they try to work out who thinks what. Think about a story's message, which is what we did with the uh, wind and the sun. And relate a text to your own experience. So all of those are good ways of students to use their critical thinking skills. And what you'll see as we go on is that I might come up with some of those activity ideas again for the other skills that we talked about because like I said before they don't exist independently of one another very often when students are thinking critically they're also collaborating or they're also communicating all right so that's critical thinking now let's have a look at our second of the four C's and that's collaboration as I said before hopefully your students are collaborating anyway because um, that's just what you do in the classroom. You have to talk to one another, you have to work together. So collaboration is all about working with others, sharing responsibility, assigning different roles within a group, and being flexible. <clears throat> and of course, you'll be very well aware of the fact that in the classroom we often use pair work, group work, and teamwork, and those are all very good ways of getting your students to collaborate. And you can take the simplest of activities and you can find different ways of getting pair work, group work and teamwork out of those activities. So I thought I'd just give you an example. This is a game. This is a classic game. You'll know how to play this. Spot the difference. So there are 10 differences between the picture, the two pictures. How quickly can you find them? Let's see how many differences you can find. Kite. I think there is a, it's raining in the top one, yeah, the parrot, that's right, there's one parrot and then there's two parrots, there's a cake, a drink, swimmers, yeah, you, you probably can't see the bottom picture very well, but actually the cake has all disappeared and that's ants, there are ants going and eating the remnants, the hair colour, the swimmers in the sea, the clothes, I think you've got them all, very good, well done. The smoothie, yep, that's another thing. All right, so you've spotted those differences. <clears throat> so let's just see the different ways that you can get students to play that spot the difference game. So first of all, in pairs, you can get the students working together, which is kind of what we've done. We look at both pictures and talk about the differences. Alternatively, you can just give picture A to one student, picture B to the other student, and they can describe their pictures to each other. So that's a little bit more challenging. They have to do a bit more communication because they can't see the other person's picture. You can do group work. So in that case, you get students together in one group with one of the pictures. In their groups, they work together to write sentences about the picture. And then you'll take one student from group A, one student from group B, and then they compare their sentences together. So that's real group work and they're really collaborating to try and get those sentences. And you can use teamwork and teamwork is great when you want to do something competitive. So you get the students to race to find the 10 differences first. So then again, you're getting them to work as a team. The quicker they find those differences, the more likely they are to win. And I'm sure you'll know that your, uh, your students always love to um, take part in competitions and try to win. So that's just one little game and all the different ways that you can get your students to work collaboratively to play that game. Let's have a look at something else. So this is um, uh, in look we have some school trip pages so this is where students get a chance to go on a kind of virtual school trip 
um, visit lots of different places and there are also some videos that go with these pages so you get to see some really interesting places all around the world. What do you think the monkeys are doing here? What do you think the story is behind this picture? It's a festival. I think you've got it on the nose. That's quite right. It's a type of tradition, food offerings. They're trying to get the food. Yep. You see, you're very good because uh, my earlier group, they all thought that the monkeys were stealing the food, but you've got it right. This is actually a monkey festival. Yep. So here's a little bit about it. It's the Lokburi. Sorry if my pronunciation isn't very good. The Lokburi Monkey Festival. Um, and uh, monkeys, macaque monkeys in Lotbori have they have a special monkey festival for the macaque monkeys, and they put up huge tables with all this food, and uh, all the monkeys come and enjoy the food. So exactly as you've said, Monica, people prepare the feast for the monkeys. That's right. So what you can then do is you can do um, a really nice little project. And that's where you get your students to collaborate and work together. So having watched the video and found out about the monkeys and answered some questions, you then ask your students to work together in groups. They can do some research in groups. They can find out about other festivals that celebrate animals. Um, they can find photos and draw pictures. And that's all where they're working together until finally they give a presentation to the class together. So it's an, a project is a really great way of getting your students to collaborate and work together. Um, and that's just one example. OK. Finally, one more idea that we have for collaboration is um, this is an exam type activity, but Trying to get your students to write stories together can be a really nice way to get them to collaborate. So this activity is a review. So it's a review of the vocabulary that students have learned in the last two units. Um, some of that target vocabulary is in the is in the box here. Blow a whistle, cut, first aid kit, foggy, hill, plaster, rescue team, stone and stream. And then in their pairs, they look at the pictures and they use the words to describe the story and they're taking turns and that's really important because when they're taking turns they have to collaborate because they have to listen to each other and they have to respond to the ideas that the other student has in order to build their story based on the pictures. So that's just another way that students can collaborate and um, work together to do something and at the same time also revise their vocabulary. So. Here are some ideas for collaborative tasks that you can use in the classroom. You can use drama and role play activities. So just before we had a look at um, students building a story together and you can always then extend that and say right now act out the story, make a drama out of it. That's a great way for students to collaborate. And if you have students who feel a bit, little bit embarrassed and maybe don't really want to act out in front of others, well, you can give them other roles within the drama. Um, they can still take part. Competitive team games. Um, I, uh, I mentioned before the, the way that you could uh, have the spot the difference and you could make that into a competitive game with the two teams racing to try and find the differences first. Discussions and debates. They can work very well as collaborative tasks particularly with debates when you've got when you're trying to get students to maybe argue a particular point of view get them to work together first in groups and talk about all the things they might be able to say before you start the debate so discussions and debates are a great way to work collaboratively project work um, as I pointed out with a monkey festival Interviews and surveys, another really good way to work collaboratively to get your students wandering around the class, asking each other questions, finding out about each other. Solving puzzles, storytelling. Oh, that's it, yes. Okay, so those are our, our examples of collaborative tasks. All right, so we've looked at critical thinking, we've looked at collaborative tasks. The next one is communication. So this is the third of the four C's that we're talking about. And as I said before, um, 
you couldn't really have an English class without some level of communication. So I imagine that your students are communicating all the time anyway. Um, and communicating is sharing information, expressing thoughts and opinions, listening to others, using verbal, written and multimedia uh, messages. And um, I think it's really important. I think sometimes when we think about communication, we just think about spoken communication. It's also really important for students to learn to listen. Um, to learn to take their turn, listen to others, and respond to what other people are saying. And obviously using written and multimedia messages are very important too. So let's look at some examples of how we can use communicative, ta communicative tasks. Okay, this is a very simple game. This is just from um, level one of Look, so it's for really basic English. And what I really like about this game is how many different things you can do with it and how many different ways you can get your students to communicate. And um, it, it might be because when I started my career, I wasn't a writer. Well, I was a teacher and then I worked as an editor for a long time. And um, when I worked as an editor, I, I really had to think hard about how much it cost to put things like pictures in books. So I got this big thing about if you're going to use a picture, let's really make it work and let's see how much we can do with pictures. And I think it's the same with a teacher. You know, if you when you're teaching, if you're going to go to the effort of putting a nice picture up for students to look at, then try and do the most possible with that picture. And here are some ideas of the things that we can do with this one picture. Um, so it, the basic idea is that that this is a game and that students will work in pairs and they will let's see if I can get my pointer so one student would point to this and say it's a donkey and one student would point to this animal and say it's a sheep but there are lots of other things you can do with pictures like these you can tell students to work together and find out which ones are inside and which ones are outside you can challenge students to name as many colors as possible and point to them at the same time. You can ask them to talk to each other about which picture they like best and which picture they don't like. Um, you can ask them to say which things they've got, and which things they haven't got. So there are all sorts of different ways. Oh, that's nice. You can create a story using all of the pictures in order. That's a really nice idea. And that is creative as well, so I like that. So I would just say, when you have a nice page with lots of pictures, think of different ways that you can use it. Not just the ideas in the, in the student's book or whatever book you're using, but other ideas to make the most out of it and to get your students really talking to each other. OK, so here's another idea. Um, in Look, we have a video page for every unit. So every unit has one little video. And what we've tried to do is we use uh, real children from all around the world um, talking about their real lives. Um, and I think that's very motivating for children because they're seeing kids their own age who are just talking about ordinary life. Um, and another thing that I think is really important is that these kids, their English is very good, but they don't have standard UK or standard American accents. So they will have slight accents from the countries that they're from. And I think that's a very, very real context for students to communicate and to, to hear English. Because after all, I think most of the time when your students are interacting using English, they're probably using English talking to other people for whom English isn't their first language. Um, and I think Emily's now, Emily, are you going to show us some of this video so that we can see what it's like? I think Emily's going to start playing it. Here we go. I'm Emilia. I'm Marcel. Marcel, who has a cool job in your family? 
My uncle Gustavo, he's got a super cool job. What does your uncle do for work? He's a soccer player. Is he on Brazil's national team? No, he isn't. He plays for a small team in Brazil, but he's young. One day, he can play for Brazil's team. Is he good? Yes, he's great. He can really run and he can kick the ball too. What do you want to be? Me? I want to be a soccer player too. Hi, Rafi. Who has a cool job in your family? My grandpa. And what does your grandpa do? He's a farmer. He has a really big farm. He grows food. Fruits and vegetables. Then he brings it to the market. People like Grandpa for his good food. Does your Grandpa like his job? Yes, he does. Does he work a lot? Yes, he does. He works six days a week. On Saturdays, I help him. We go to the market together with the food. What do you want to be? I want to be a farmer too. I like to be outside, and I want to grow fruit and vegetables like my grandpa. Emilia, does someone in your family have a cool job? Yes, my grandma's job is cool. And what does your grandma do for work? She's a doctor. Does she work at a hospital? No, she doesn't. She works at a little shop in town. A shop. But she's a doctor. Well, she's an eye doctor. She looks at people's eyes. Lots of people can't see well. Grandma helps them. She works with them to get glasses. <laughs> what do you want to be? I want to be a vet, an animal doctor. I love animals. Okay, so I'm sorry if some of you couldn't see that video, but um, you should be able to, I think, when you um, when you watch the recording of this, I'm, I'm really hoping you'll be able to see it then. I'm glad that those of you who could see it enjoyed it. Um, I just think it's really nice because the kids, as I said, you know, they're like the Italian girl had a lovely Italian accent. Um, it's really sweet, but it's also very understandable, and they're they're talking about real people. Um, in terms of communication, you know, there are ways that we can use that in the classroom. So first of all, the students are listening, they're watching the video, they're understanding it, and then they have time to ask an answer. So they'll say, "What does your granddad do? He's a teacher. Does he work in our school? No, he doesn't." So they're speaking and listening, and then draw a picture of your someone of someone in your family. Um, so then they're drawing and writing. So there's lots of communication that goes on there and they're seeing some great examples of communication in the video. So I'm glad that those of you who uh, who could see it enjoyed it because, uh, yeah, I think it's great. Okay, so another classic way um, that we can get our students to communicate is through information gap activities. And I'm sure that you're very... Um, you know all about information gap activities. So here's just a little example. Um, this is from a unit where uh, we did quite a lot of work on national parks. So student A gets some information about Komodo National Park. So they read the information. It's very simple. There aren't, uh, there's not too much text there. And then they answer the, um, they fill in the information here in the chart. So they just find out where is the park, what's the famous animal, what are the things to do, what are the places to stay. And then student B has information about another national park. This is Khao Sok National Park in Thailand. And again, they read the information, they fill in the chart, and then they ask each other questions in order to fill in the other part of the chart. So it's very simple. Um, in terms of setting up and explaining to students what they have to do, but there's a real reason for them to communicate because they need to complete their um, their charts. And it's also quite interesting because they get to find out about national parks in another part of the world. Okay, so 
Let me give you some examples of how you can use communicative tasks in the classroom. Information gap activities, and I just showed you an example of some of those. Um, role play activities, um, again, and I mentioned that before with collaborative um, tasks, but obviously you need to be able to talk to each other and listen to each other when you do role plays. Interviews and surveys, again. Um, writing notes, letters and texts to each other's. Pen friends are a great way of encouraging students to communicate. Um, so I don't know if your students have pen friends or if you have any pen friend networks. Uh, my younger daughter, who's learning German at the moment, she's got two German pen friends. And they started off writing um, little postcards to each other. They're now on Snapchat. Um, and uh, I can actually see her German really getting better because she really, really wants to be able to communicate with her two pen friends in Germany. So it makes it very real for her. So that's a nice thing to be able to do. Pair work, of course. Um, show and tell. Um, I guess you're probably familiar with show and tell. It's a, I think it's originally a, quite an American idea, um, but I know that primary schools in the UK do this too. So um, uh, when my kids were at primary school, every Friday morning, um, they would take it in turns that one of the children in the class would bring in something, could be anything, could be a favorite teddy bear, could be a football, could be their favorite book, whatever it is, they can choose and they just talk a little bit about why it's their favorite thing. Um, and that's a really nice way of getting kids to communicate and they're motivated to do it because they're talking about themselves and kids like nothing better than talking about themselves. So that's an idea. And finally, discussions on Moodle or school intranet. Um, obviously, there are always issues with social media and you might be worried you don't want to encourage your kids to be going onto places where they might meet people that you can't control or their parents might not like the idea of it. But if your school has an intranet within it, if it has some kind of Moodle, that's a great way for kids to get to communicate and you can give them a task like um, write, uh, write messages to your friends in English using the school intranet. And that's quite good fun for them because they're interacting with technology which they enjoy. So those are some just some examples of communicative tasks that you can use in the classroom. All right, so what have we talked about? We've talked about critical thinking, we've talked about collaboration, and we've talked about communication. And can you remember what the fourth C is? Let's test you. Let's see if you can remember what the fourth C is. Yes, Carolina, Carolina. Creativity, very good. Yep, creativity. So creativity is not just about creating actual things like writing stories or making things. Creativity is also about having creative thinking ability. So thinking outside the box, I know it's a horrible term, but thinking outside the box or solving problems or looking at issues from a different perspective. So brainstorming is a really great creative activity and I'm sure you use um, brainstorming in your classroom. Well, that's a great way of getting kids just to think creatively and to share ideas. So let's have a look at some creative tasks that we could use. Um, here's a really simple task. I think, again, this is probably from level one. So the, the um, English is really simple. They're learning some words, dress, jeans, sh shirt, shoes, skirt, socks, trousers, t-shirt. Um, and the students practice that. Let's go back point to the students practice that. They listen and point to the words. They repeat them. They point and say. But then the teacher's book has got some really nice ways that you can make uh, some creative activities from it. So you can get the students to design an outfit for a party. You draw and color an outfit on the board to model it for them and you add labels like a big blue hat or brown shoes and then you get them to draw and color their own clothes and label them and show their pictures to a partner and make a classroom display. So it's a really simple um, creative task that even your youngest students would be able to do and it makes them really motivated and interested because they're getting to talk about their own ideas and make up their own party clothes. So this is a little bit more, um, uh, more I wouldn't say intermediate, but maybe pre-intermediate. Um, this is just a kind of photocopyable type activity that you can use and you can use it to, uh, it's a great way of reviewing words. 
So you can pick out um, how many words have we got here? One, two, three, four, six, seven, one, two, three, four. Twenty-eight words um, from uh, that you want to review. So they might be from your last uh, month's work or your last term's work. Um, and you can try and put in a mixture. You'll see here we've got a mixture of nouns, we've got some adjectives, and we've got some verbs. Um, and then the students, well, there are numerous ways that you can use this. You can cut them up into separate cards. You can deal out the cards, and then each child will get five cards and they have to make a story. Or they can just pick their own words if you don't want to deal them out. So they can just choose five words and make a story with that. They can work together collaboratively or they can work independently, but it's a way for them to be very creative. Um, and even when you're teaching grammar, which you don't always think of as being the most creative thing in the world, you know, you think of grammar as being very kind of set and uh, nevertheless, uh, there are ways that you can get your students to practice their grammar creatively. So in this activity, you've got your standard, you know, you present the grammar, it's expressions of quantity. So you're presenting it, you're teaching them when to use any and some, and then they're doing the completing the sentences. So that's good practice. And then they're using it more in context in a whole text. But then if we have a look at activity four, I think, yes, there we are. There's activity four. This is where they get to be creative. So make five sentences about you, three true and two, two false. Use few, a little, and a lot of. So now they're going to use their creative ideas to think of those five sentences. They're also talking about themselves, which, as I said before, kids love to do. And then they read out their sentences, and their partners have to try and guess which sentences are true and which sentences are false. So, as I said, even when they're practicing grammar, you can still get your, your students to be creative. Um, and finally, if you remember, I said that I love to use photos. And uh, so I started this presentation with a photo. Can you remember what the photo we used for critical thinking right at the beginning of the presentation? Let's see how well you are concentrating. Yes, very good. The shepherds, right. So we used a photo of shepherds and cell phones, and that was all about critical thinking and getting the students to try and guess what the story was behind the picture. And equally, um, photos massively lend themselves to creative activities too. So let's have a look at another nice photo. Um, this is a beautiful photo of um, Texas, USA, a cloudy sky before a storm in Texas, USA. Um, and then you can have some pic some questions like this. So look at the photo, answer the questions. What can you see? What time of day it is? Is it so? That's your critical thinking, where they're looking at the photo and they're trying to make up their minds about the clues as to what time of day it is and where it is. But then look at this last question here. It's a real creative question. Imagine you're outside this house. How are you feeling? So that's a really great way to get kids to use their imagination. And that's not the only thing that you could do with that picture. You can ask them to imagine who lives in the house, what their job is. You could ask them to write a story about the house, um, write a description. There's so many ways that you can use photos. And um, they're so beautiful. I'm glad that you're enjoying looking at that, because I really love it too. <laughs> so I wanted to share it with you. OK, so let's just go through some examples of creative tasks. So these are some creative tasks that you can use in the classroom. Um, for the most primary, for your youngest students, cutting and making and coloring in, um, writing and acting out dialogues and mini plays. Um, and we talked before about dialogues and mini plays. That's a great way to be creative. Um, project work again. You know, so we've talked about project work collaborative, it's communicative, and it's also very creative. So they can create a map or a mask or a leaflet. Um, solving puzzles, that's where I was saying that creative isn't just about making things, it's also about thinking creatively and thinking outside the box. Um, make a video. Now, um, I know that it's, I'm not imagining that your students are going to have the technology necessarily to make videos, but one thing you can do is that you can use um, some of the videos that you already have that students might have watched 
you can turn the sound off and get them to make up their own voiceovers for videos and that's something that kids really enjoy doing because then it feels like they're you know they're part of the video so that's a fun creative thing for students to do and if they do have access to films they can also oh great so someone said my 10 year old has just made a video about their room well that's perfect that's a really lovely way of getting uh, getting kids to practice their English so it's a good creative task and use new language to make your own sentences so I showed you that example from the grammar page and think of the story behind the picture um, which is uh, what we did for uh, the house with the clouds and the sunset so just to remind you what we've talked about today is our 21st century skills and I hope I've given you some ideas for ways that you can incorporate critical thinking collaboration communication and creativity into your classroom and um, we've got about five or six minutes before the end so I'd just like to say thank you so much for uh, all your comments and um, if you have any questions now is the time to ask them and I hope that I might be able to give you some answers but thank you very much for paying attention and particularly for those of you for whom it is now nearly midnight thank you for st still being awake well done You've done really well so yeah please go ahead and ask any questions if you have any 1 a.m. oh my goodness Well, it's, it's, thank you for all your thank yous. <laughs> um, if there's uh, someone no said, questions. is this applicable to adults and students? Sorry, Emily, I'll just answer this one question and then uh, someone said, is it, I think all the ideas I had could be used with adults and secondary school students as well as with young kids. It's just uh, the kind of language that you use to practice it. But yes, I would say it is applicable. Yeah. Okay, Emily, can I, shall I go over to you? Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Kath, so much for this webinar. And thank you, everyone, uh, for attending here today. Kath, like Kath said, I know it's very late where some of you are or very early in the morning. So thank you for joining. Um, I do see a few questions about Look. I'm going to put the link in the chat box now. And we'll be sending some information on the follow-up email, too. Um, and you can get the link to contact your local representative to learn more um, about obtaining a copy of Look. I'd love to play this short video if anyone has time. It's about two minutes long um, that does just highlight Look. Um, so I think it's really wonderful and I'd love to play it for anyone who can see. Sorry, I think it might be a little laggy. It is on the um, site that I put in the chat box. I'll put it back there now um, so you can check it out there too. I'm sorry the video wasn't working right here. Uh, a few last minute things before we wrap up. Like I mentioned at the beginning, we will be sending along uh, the certificate, uh, the slides, as well as a recording from the session. And the recording and slides will be uploaded on our webinar website. Um, and I know, Marianne, I'm sorry that you couldn't see the video, but we, it is on the site there. So if you click the link, you'll be able to see it. Um, you can watch it at your leisure. We hope you can definitely join us again soon uh, for another webinar. We do have one coming up for young learners on uh, March 18th, and it's about grammar. And then we'd love for you to follow the InFocus blog. Kath is a contributor to that, so you can definitely check that out too. She has a new series for young learners on there and um, we'll have some upcoming posts on there as well too and then we'd love for you to connect with us on our social media channels thank you so much for joining us today i'm going to send you all to a brief uh, feedback survey now and we'd love to hear your feedback from the webinar so thank you and thank you again kath if you have any questions you can always contact us at ngl.webinars at i'm just going to put that in the chat too all right thank you everyone going to send you to the survey now Bye.